Um, well, thanks everybody for uh, for turning out today. Um, uh, obviously, the uh, the reason for us to convene here, uh, well, I guess it's, there's a sort of a proximate reason and a specific reason. Uh, the specific reason is David Wessel's terrific new book, Red Ink, uh, 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 a brief but enjoyable tour of the mechanics of the budget. Um, and I guess the more sort of proximate reason is uh, this budget thing uh, is uh, is taking on a sense of urgency. Uh, and uh, and uh, these deadlines that we're approaching at the end of this this year are really starting to focus the minds of uh, people in Washington. So the book is incredibly well timed, suffice it to say. Um, uh, I guess we should start by just introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm uh, Noam Scheiber. I'm a, a Schwartz Fellow here at New America and a writer at the New Republic magazine. And I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Sure. I'm David Wessel. I'm the economics editor of the Wall Street Journal. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Goldwine. I'm the policy director at a group called the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. And I also work here at the New America Foundation. Um, so just uh, uh, by way of sort of amplification, I think these, these are two of the smartest uh, uh, budget and economics wonks that you'll find uh, in this town. I've been uh, bowled over by both of their work over the years. Uh, and uh, I can't recommend the book enough. It's really a terrific read. Um, I figured that um, we one place to start uh, was uh, in the kind of historical section that you have in the book. And you know, reading the, the, that chapter, it struck me that um, with only slight word changes here and there, you could have kind of um, reframed it as the history of the conservative movement, or at least the kind of economic conservative movement. Um, you know, there are various moments in that chapter. You cite sort of the six big moments in, in kind of modern budget history. And most of those moments are kind of um, real milestones in the, kind of, in, the, in the history of recent conservatism. Uh, uh, I was struck by a couple of things. I mean, one is uh, the tax, uh, the deficit deal that Bush did in 1990 was balanced. The, the proportions were uh, $2 of spending cuts for every dollar of revenue increases. And the deal that Obama offered in his grand bargain last summer was what, five to one, five dollars of cuts for every one dollar of revenue increases. And that's if you counted those revenue increases as bona fide revenue increases. So um, you know, you went from a Republican president signing on to a two to one uh, split to a Democratic president offering up a five to one split. Um, and it just kind of shows you how the center of gravity has really shifted over time. I was wondering is if, if as you were writing this, if that sort of looms in your mind, that, um, that these guys have been remarkably successful at moving the center, to, center of gravity rightward over the past generation or so. Well, I, I think your, your point is absolutely right. I mean, I think Richard Nixon's economic policies would be to the left of the center of gravity of the Democratic uh, Party right now. I mean, wage and right price controls and the earned income tax credit and all that. But, um, I didn't do that. I didn't think of it that way because I was trying in this book to say we, there are facts and there are choices. And I'm a little worried that too much of the journalism has starts with the choice and then assembles a set of facts to back it up. So that, for instance, if you have one view, you go on MSNBC and you marshal a set of facts to support that. If you have another view, you go on Fox and set, uh, marshal a separate set of facts to do that. And anybody who happens to watch both channels, I think there's probably 14 people in that category, uh, must be confused to see the same set of facts, both purporting to describe the whole of the federal budget. So I was trying not to do this through the lens of politics, um, point one. Point two, you're right. I mean, I started the story a little differently. I would say that something big happened in the Reagan years where uh, the, the Republican Party, and I quote, uh, the famous Jude Winiski on uh, Santa Claus in the book, uh, the Republican Party decided they'd rather have lower taxes than lower deficits. And so Reagan successfully cut taxes, and we had an increase in spending. We got big deficits. Unlike the Republicans of today, he realized he's gone too far and then raised taxes, and then did a, a, a revenue-neutral tax reform that Mitt Romney probably wouldn't accept today because it raised the capital gains tax rate to the same place as ordinary income. Uh, you have to look at George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush as an aberration. He did a deal that raised taxes, cut spending, relied on Democrats to get it th through Congress. 
put us on the path towards smaller deficits and eventually a budget surplus. And the lesson the Republicans took from that, you don't get reelected if you do that. And that's where they've been ever since. Yeah, you know, the, it, it, the, the point about Reagan, I think, is really important. And it's an important moment in, in your, the history that you tell. Uh, because, as you say, sort of prior to that, uh, the norm had been um, you basically strive for balance. You, you do a big tax cut, you find offsets, and the thing roughly balances out. And as you say, they just threw this logic out the door and passed their uh, historically enormous tax cut. Um, you know, Mark, as is, is you um, look at the recent history of budgeting, um, how important do you think that element of it is? Just kind of junking norms. You know, there are all these, there are laws, right? You know, the president has to present a budget and, um, you know, taxes are in the House. But um, there are a lot of norms, too, that make the budget process work. And I think, if, uh, again, if you read David's history, um, one recurring theme is these norms slowly going by the wayside. And, and, you know, one contemporary data point in that was, you know, his discussion of the Medicare Part D, the prescription drug bill, which, you know, was this totally unpaid for new <laughs> entitlement. Um, and even the kind of procedural norms were set aside in that context where, you know, I think Tom DeLay, they held the vote open for an extra 13 minutes or whatever to twist arms because they didn't have the votes initially with the allotted time. Um, how, how important do you think that, is, that, that theme is, that just the, the kind of wasting away of these norms, or depending on how you see it, the, the just sort of crass you know, rejection of the norms to get a brass tax result? Uh, incredibly important. There, there used to be an idea in this country that we would have balanced budgets, that balancing the budget was responsible. Occasionally, we'd have wars or other national crises, and we'd borrow for a while, then we'd find a way to pay it back. Uh, we don't do that anymore. I think. Of course, tax rate cuts are always popular. Uh, uh, I think early in Reagan, they, there was an attempt to cut taxes, but also cut spending, so pay for spending. And then in 86, we cut taxes, but we paid for it by closing loopholes. Then it turned out it's politically easier to just cut the taxes and not worry about uh, the painful part. And uh, that was a lesson learned by, by both parties, um, particularly in the second Bush administration, when we saw things like the prescription drug bill unpaid for because it was easier and because it preempted what uh, the Democrats were going to otherwise do anyway. And we saw two rounds of tax cuts. And that's continued, frankly, in this administration as well. So we continue to extend and build upon those tax cuts. Right. And I think that um, I think it's a very good point. Uh, two things to mention in that regard. One is uh, the Medicare prescription drug benefit, unpaid for, was really a bipartisan program. Absolutely. So anybody who thinks that one party is responsible and the other isn't has to deal with that fact. The second thing, and I think you're exactly right to focus on the norms, is sometimes there's a fantasy in Washington that if we just change the rules that we would force the members of Congress right. to do the right thing. That, in a sense, was the motivation be behind the thing that leads to the fiscal cliff. Um, but my reading of history is that first you have a consensus about the norms and what we're trying to do. You agree what you're going to do, and then you build the rules to kind of make sure you do it. But the rules don't force you to make the choices about taxes and spending. Um, one, one final point on norms, uh, and I, I remember you know, getting very exercised about it at the time, and you, you mentioned it a bit in the book. But um, um, you, you know, I was more reminded by, uh, of this just because of your discussion of the various people who have been head of the CBO. And, um, you know, the, the sort of rectitude that they brought to the job. Um, you know, I think one thing that you ended up seeing in the second Bush administration, the 2001 and 2009 Bush administration, was um, this real kind of monkeying around, and this has always happened to some extent before, but this monkeying around with, with phase-ins and phase-outs and sunsetting and all to just, as you say, to, to kind of start with the result you want and work backwards. How, how, how big a change was that? I mean, was that... Uh, a change in degree, or was that sort of a qualitatively different way of doing sort of budget accounting in order to get in, in order to get the end result? Well, I sense that you think it was a qualitatively different <laughs> I, thing. I, I, I've tipped my hand. <laughs> yes. I, I think, Look, go ahead. No, uh, the '86 tax reform phased phased in the tax rates when the numbers didn't work. Uh, we've seen that other times. I think phase-ins and budget games have always happened since there have been budgets. Uh, they've gotten worse over time, and. Congress has gotten more used to this idea that they're kind of a maintenance Congress and they can let things expire. Um, the fiscal cliff is sort of the ultimate example of that, everything expiring at once. But I, I think what we're seeing is the ratcheting up of something that's existed 
as long as budgeting has. Right, and I think what happens is that they keep, uh, they keep finding ways to do end runs around the rules they made. I mean, why do we have 10-year budget estimates? Well, because when we only had five-year budget right. estimates, all the costs would end up in the sixth year. Right. And so there is this constant war between how do you get the rules so that it makes it harder to get credit score. Well, I'm not going to go there, but credit scoring is another great example. How do you account for loan guarantees? It used to be we counted for them zero. Well, there's just a guarantee. Then we say, well, that doesn't make sense, so you have to do a net present value of what it's worth. And then you set uh, forth an army of lobbyists and congressional staff to figure out how to work in the interstices of that rule. I think that's the same thing that happened. I don't think anybody was very thoughtful, to say the least, about what would happen when the tax cuts expired. And this notion that there's a downside, this uh, much uh, bemoaned uncertainty, uh, which is an artifact of these temporary things, uh, it is, was unappreciated at the time. Right. Uh, well, I'm going to come back to the fiscal cliff because that's a, a whole sort of part of this discussion unto itself. But um, let's just take a brief detour into healthcare. I mean, you, you have a chapter in which you sort of stress, and, and any sort of informed budget wonk will tell you that healthcare, if not the entire ball game, it, it's, it's most of the ball game. Um, and you have a very nice sort of portrait of, of Rob Portman in there who, uh, if for no other reason you should read just because he may be Mitt Romney's running mate uh, very soon. Um, but, um, you know, one thing I was, I was curious to, um, to, to hear you guys pronounce on is, um, is this matter of Obamacare. Um, how much, you know, the administration and the architects of the bill, you know, Peter Orzag in particular, will tell you that this, this really has a series of game changers. And this, this, you know, this line item, you know, this massive, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, industrial complex in the economy um, uh, that's reflected in is a huge part of the budget. Um, that they have managed to sort of, if not totally tame it, set us on the path to doing that, and that these changes are just unappreciated uh, uh, at the moment, but will become uh, apparent over time. How, how much do you think that this bill, um, you know, on the sort of cost-saving side, uh, will will end up mattering in ten or twenty years, assuming it, you know, d doesn't get repealed and go by the wayside? Well, I don't think we really know. I mean, you expressed Peter Orzag's view pretty well that he has helped the government plant a lot of seeds, not knowing which one of them will blossom and which one will turn out to be oak trees. But he's confident that we have these demonstration grants, we'll discover that this thing works, and then we'll adopt it, and we have this iPad board that's going to make it happen and all that stuff. Um, um, I, I think I'm in the show me category, and I, I would say two things specific about that. One is, uh, we now see in Massachusetts that they're trying to do something much more aggressive to control costs, a notion that you have to basically put a limit on it and then figure out how you live within it. And secondly, when you talk to people in the administration about what is the fiscal deal they would do after the election in that great moment of harmonic convergence between the day after the election day and the end of the year, it usually involves doing some more things to save money in Medicare in particular, probably on the beneficiary side. So I don't think that we can, I think we're caught in a dilemma. We can't fix, Med, we can't fix the budget without fixing Medicare and Medicaid. We can't fix Medicare and Medicaid without fixing the way we organize our healthcare system. We can't wait to fix our entire healthcare system before we save some money on Medicare and Medicaid if we're going to fix our deficit. Mark, how do, how do you feel free to weigh in on Obamacare? Well, I, I think that's right. I'll, I'll um, take a little detour here and talk about something that was discussed in the book, which yeah. is uh, there was a lot of skepticism over how the Congressional Budget Office scored yeah. uh, Obamacare. Particularly, those in favor of it thought they weren't getting enough credit for all of these pilot programs, which have a lot of potential. And of course, those who opposed it thought that CBO was giving too much credit to things that they didn't think were going to happen. It's something that um, uh, David's book goes into a little is is how CBO is kind of stuck as this nonpartisan body and they uh, take hits from both sides and the truth is we have no idea if their scores right CBO says the health care bill is going to save a hundred billion dollars for ten years that's there are many trillions of dollars changing hands if we think that we can estimate with that type of precision we're kidding ourselves um, what we can do is is our best to understand uh, where we're going and I, I think it's clear that there is some potential out of this bill. It's also clear there's some risks out of it, and it's clear we need to do more. And uh, I, I agree with D David's point, and I, I would even go further. We can't wait to see what happens to the entire healthcare system to start making improvements to Medicare and Medicaid to get them on 
a better path? Um, it, you know, one, one of the great, I thought, the great moments in your book is the sort of smackdown, for lack of a better word, between Peter Orzag, the Obama budget director, and Doug Elmendorf, his, pre his successor at, at um, CBO. And it was interesting because I think the, uh, the Obama administration hoped that, um, that Peter Orzag would carry great weight in precisely these sorts of smackdowns. And I, I think he probably did. I think he was a credible face for it. But at, at certain points, it got so <laughs> sort of nasty that it, it, you know, I think any pretense of, of kind of, um, you know, uh, civil conversation between two budget wonks went out the window and Orzak just started accusing Elmendorf of just, of just pure, you know, almost partisan hackery, I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Were, you, were you sort of surprised to uh, see this kid as... Yeah, I mean, this tells you about, we're talking here, we're now into the, uh, you got three budget nerds here. Yes, exactly. We think it's exciting that there's a fight between Peter Orzak that, right. and Doug Elmendorf. Right. Some, somebody in the book I quote, now I'm drawing a blank on his name, has said it was like um, Peter Orzag had invented a new hula hoop, and Doug Elmendorf was the banker that said, you want money for that? Um, but I think there is a, a, a more important point there, and actually uh, a hopeful one. And you know, it's a little hard to be hopeful these days in Washington. I think uh, the last four years have kind of sucked the hope out of everything that, that we that had, particularly on fiscal policy. But in 1970s, uh, the Congress took con a little bit of control from the Nixon White House and created the, the, the House Budget Committee, the Senate Budget Committee, and the Congressional Budget Office. And the Congressional Budget Office really is one of the few institutions in Washington that's kind of worked the way it's supposed to, which is encouraging. And the way it was supposed to work, a lot of this has to do with the tone that Alice Rivlin set when she set it up, but it's continued because the budget leadership on both sides of the aisle has protected it from political pressure. The way it's supposed to work is to say something like, you make a good argument, but we're not completely sure of it, so we're not going to give you credit for it. And that's a very conservative way of scoring, and it may prevent you from doing some things that would save a lot of money or raise a lot of money in the future, but it does prevent you from getting a little bit too Alice in Wonderland here, which is what people tend to do. The proponents of the Affordable Care Act wanted to believe that it would save lots of money and we should be able to spend that now. The proponents of tax cuts believe it will create lots of economic growth in the future and we should be able to spend that now. And what CBO has done with Republican and Democratic directors is kind of lean against that wind. Uh, they're not always successful and they're certainly not always right. Um, Newt Gingrich is off on some new jihad against about CEO, C CBO I've seen, but in general, uh, people as different as um, uh, uh, Chris Van Hollen and Paul Ryan or the, their counterparts in the Senate have protected CBO from this partisan pressure precisely because they've come to value having someone who you can count on to give their best opinion about what's going to happen. Even though, as Mark says, these are opinions or projections or estimates about things that no mortal can actually know. I believe we uh, tried to score Newt Gingrich's uh, plan using sort of CBO methodology, and I believe he called us flat worlders. Yeah. So he called you flat? Flat, flat worlders. worlders. We believe the world is flat, and Got I think it. that's kind of how he sees I see. I see. the argument is CBO doesn't look at things dynamically. They just think right. the world is flat. Right. Uh, of course, everyone is going to use that to make their own case. Uh, when I worked in the Fiscal Commission, we had some industry groups that would come in and give us a plan that they thought saved $120 billion, and we'd take it to CBO, and they'd say, no, that's $1.2 billion. <laughs> right. um, so uh, people can have very large imaginations about how much you can save. Um, just one other thing on healthcare before we move on. Um, I have heard, just in kind of casual conversations with administration officials, that, um, you know, I, I should back up, actually. So one of the kind of uh, uh, narratives that you lay out in the book is this sort of, um, you know, Paul Ryan uh, school uh, of, of kind of pure mm -hmm. spending reduction, or not, not pure, but uh, heavily mm -hmm. spending reduction based approach to renting in the deficit, uh, you know, versus, you know, uh, you know, I mean, the Obama approach generally, I guess. Um, and um, it's interesting because if you, if you see this debate between the administration and Paul Ryan and Democrats and Paul Ryan play out, you would get the impression that um, that they regard this guy as kind of a budgetary antichrist who's just bent on, you know, uh, on, on, on destroying their most cherished uh, values. And, uh, but if you actually talk to sort of administration budget wonks, and I'm sure you guys have had similar conversations, you sort of hear things like, well, you know, not so crazy. I mean, um, if, you know, 
if we, we could imagine doing a sort of Medicare voucher type thing, we would fund it more generously than he does. We would make sure it kept up with you know medical inflation over time, but but it's not so crazy, you know. Um, a, I'm wondering, do, do you guys sort of hear similar things? And B, do you think that that could be kind of an end game for what we do to rein in Medicare over the long term? Uh, well, one, um, yes, they made him the Antichrist because it's a famous game in Washington. You need an enemy. And uh, Paul Ryan was providing a pretty uh, juicy target given the size of some of his spending cuts. Second, I think there's always grudging respect in this debate um, between the both sides when they think the other guy knows what he's talking about which, as you know, is not a threshold that most members of Congress meet on this subject. Uh, so you always have to admire the guy who plays his cards well and knows what he's talking about and seems to have some intellectual um, discipline. Um, I think the healthcare thing is a riot in one respect. So basically, if you listen carefully to the debate and then extrapolate from it the way journalists do, President Obama thinks we should have exchanges for everybody under 65, but not for people over 65. And the Republicans think the opposite. So I can imagine a day when we get to some defined contribution health care uh, in Medicare. Uh, after all, uh, there is you know, Ron Wyden and Alice Rivlin. Some people on the Democratic side have proposed those things. I doubt it's going to happen soon. But I wouldn't be surprised if you were talking about a decade or two decade long horizon that we go there. You point out exactly the problem is that it's a little hard to know how to price the thing so that you keep the pressure on the system to not let costs go out of control. You get the benefits of competition, like we got in the prescription drug thing, but you don't end up uh, making it impossible for people to get the health care that they need. Um, and I think that uh, even Larry Summers and Peter Orzag haven't figured out a quite how to do that, although they're working on it, and by Friday they'll have an answer. Mark? It, any yeah, I mean, well, uh, Congressman Ryan is kind of both a wonk and an ideologue, and I think um, folks from most tribes respect his wonkdom and respect that he, I mean, if you spend some time in the room with him, he really does know what he's talking about. And uh, he, he knows budget numbers better than people that work at CBO sometimes. Uh, but he also has a, a very ideological view of what the world should look like, which of, of course, uh, as a politician on the other side, you're going to attack. That's, that's natural. Uh, in terms of whether his plan of premium support of some type can be the end game, I kind of, uh, I, I agree with David. I, this is controversial, but I, healthcare is on such an unsustainable course that there will probably have to be some type of rationing at some point. And so then you have to ask yourself the question, is the government going to do the rationing or is the private sector? Because either way, it's going to be rationing. Um, then it's a political question. Which do you think the American public will be more accepting of? I don't know the answer, but I, I wouldn't rule out something like this as an option. Yeah, let me make another point that occurs to me. You know, I've, I've read uh, a fraction of the stories that have been written about Milton Friedman's 100th anniversary of his birth. And a couple of them have made a great point, which is relevant here, that when he proposed vouchers for schools, it seemed like some crazy right-wing idea. But now, you know, given the uh, amount of unease about the quality of the public schools and the growth of charter schools, even in places where it didn't seem to be fertile, you can see it's a much more accept socially acceptable idea. Well, it's not hard for me to imagine that a decade from now, it'll be the same thing with uh, premium support or some kind of vouchers for well, Medicare. Um, block granting of welfare benefits was a crazy idea when it was first proposed, a crazy right-wing idea that was then embraced by President Bill Clinton and is the law of the land now. So things change fast. Um, let's jump, jump to the fiscal cliff, because we seem to want to go there, you know, <laughs> as, uh, uh, despite we ourselves. We not go there. Okay. Right, or, or, is yeah. the fiscal cliff something we hit, or is it something we go over? And can right, we yeah. finally agree on which, what, That's the metaphor good, what the metaphor is? Yes. Well then, so this leads actually to my first question, which is, um, I think it was the Center, uh, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, that, um, that has been trying to push back against any version of the cliff metaphor and you know has been regarding it as kind of a gentle slope. slope how how cliffy do you think it is whether or not we're hitting it or going over it or getting caught under it or whatever um you know how how steep is the is the slope how how much trouble are we in how soon if we if the cliff sneaks up on us you, you know the cbo analysis <laughs> assumes that taxes go up spending gets cut and that's a long-term uh proposition and that creates a recession. That's kind of easy to see. Uh, I think what the Congressional, what the uh, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is trying to do with a number of other people on the Democratic left is make credible for the president 
the idea that he'd be willing to go over the cliff because they think that strengthens his hands in negotiation with the Republicans if the Democrats, if the president wins re-election. Um, so everybody is taking a position because they're trying to game the thing out. Um, I, I don't have a lot to add to that except one thing that I'm afraid all the macro modelers are missing. Um, there's this notion out there that you can put in the numbers and outcomes of the size of the recession that you get or not. Uh, I think we learned in August 2011, and I think we've seen other times, that uh, when things like this happen, you can't just use the usual macro plumbing. And so, for instance, uh, imagine what happens, what, people's, what happens to people's confidence in the government and in the, in their faith in the government's ability to actually function if after the election we have two months of screaming and yelling between a re-elected President Obama, who won by this much, and a Republican Congress, which didn't lose very many seats. And we're, they, the, some of these theorists think, well, people will understand. This is just a game. We'll go over the cliff, and the third, work in, third week in January, we'll pull the car back up off the cliff. Well, I don't think the world works like that. I think that there would be large, non-economic, hard-to-measure, confidence-reducing effects of going over the cliff, even beyond those that it was. I mean, let's face it. The thing was set up for a reason. It was set up because Congress and the President thought it would force them to act, and B, it was supposed to be so uncomfortable that they wouldn't do it. Well, they kind of succeeded on the second one. Uh, so I think it's kind of troubling because if, if we're going to solve this problem, we're going to need uh, a leadership in Congress and the White House that can say to the American people, we got a deficit problem. Some of you are going to have to pay more taxes. Some of you are going to get less in benefits. Trust us. Do they really think they need to do more to erode people's trust in government? I mean, the best thing about the congressional ratings on their confidence of the public is they make the press look good. <laughs> um, just one related point about that. Maybe, Mark, you can weigh in on this. Um, I mean, if that's the case, and I, I think it's, it's totally reasonable to me, um, would we not start seeing the effects of the fiscal cliff you know, months before we actually go over or hit the fiscal cliff. I mean, you know, if you look at um, some of the surveys of business, even today, you know, the, the anxiety about whether we go over um, is already resulting in, you know, a certain amount of austerity. You think. I mean, you hear that? Tough, tough to know, exactly. Yeah, tough to know. I mean, there are two, we have basically a couple of sets of facts. One is we have these surveys of businessmen that says, oh, it's causing us to not invest. And I can certainly understand why they'd say that, particularly if they were defense contractors. On the other hand, the stock market seems to be setting new highs. So right. this great barometer of business confidence doesn't seem to be flinching. Uh, I think it gets worse as we get closer. I don't know how big it is. I don't know what you think. Sure. Um, to go back to the politics real briefly, both sides are playing poker with Jack High, and each other knows it. What the center is trying to do, and other groups, is look over the shoulder of the administration and pretend like they have two pair. So they're saying, well, it's not really a fit. It's not really a cliff. It's a slope. And it's obviously true. It's not like on January 1, suddenly the economy is going to burn to pieces. Um, but we're starting to feel the effects already, it appears. Um, both the uncertainty over what's going to happen if the fiscal cliff hits and the uncertainty of what's going to happen otherwise. I think that there's a lot of business uncertainty that's um, causing a wariness to hire and a wariness to invest. And that will ramp up as we get close to the cliff. And then the contractionary effects will probably happen pretty quickly. Not all on January 2nd, but I imagine by the end of January we'll be um, will be in recession, I would imagine. And another thing that macro models don't pick up is, you know, if, if you have a recession, that's terrible and there's a lot of human cost to that. But normal recessions we climb out of. And if it's because we reduce the debt, maybe we're better off as a result. It's a little bit different when you're coming out of a steep financial crisis with severe long-term unemployment. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence that long-term unemployment leads to real long-term effects, not the normal short-term effects we think of with inflation, but people permanently lose their skills and human capital and ability to earn for the rest of their lives. So I think a double dip recession now would be far more damaging than, say, the Volcker recession or uh, another typical recession. I'd, I would want to stay away from it. And just um, uh, on the um, you know, one element of the cliff is the, is the sequester, and one big element of that is the defense cuts. Um, David writes a lot about the Pentagon and sort of the, the kind of reflexive uh, you know, uh, antipathy toward, toward any cuts, really, even if they're sort of rational and necessary. But how, um, 
how, what's the kind of signal to noise ratio coming out of the Pentagon? How, how many of these cuts are necessary? How many can they actually withstand? And how many will actually cut bone, basically? Well, I think the problem with the, the across the board spending cuts in the Budget Control Act that leads to the sequester, a word that nobody outside of this zip code understands, um, <clears throat> is that they're kind of indiscriminate. They're across the board. So does the, is the Pentagon's budget going to be cut? Yes. I mean, uh, do, would they settle for somewhat smaller defense budget in order to get rid of these uh, across the board cuts? Yes. It's just, it's going to be an administrative nightmare. And who knows what games OMB will play if they actually have to do it. So I look at it as kind of a sideshow. I think there is a huge question about how big does the defense budget need to be post Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's a really big uh, unresolved question. And you know, when I was a kid, people used to complain that uh, there was no difference between Democrats and Republicans who were running for Congress. This was popular in the, in the, in the Nixon-Humphrey deb uh, debate. Um, and I think that this is one where there's a clear difference between the candidates. Uh, Mitt Romney wants to have a much bigger defense budget, and Barack Obama wants to shrink the defense budget, though it would still, by his current projections, be larger adjusted for inflation than we've had before in peacetime. So I don't quite see how this, how, this is going to be a hard one to resolve. Uh, most of the Republicans in Congress are resistant to defense cuts, except the, uh, the kind of uh, isolationist wing, which is ready to cut. I was on a radio show with Mo Brooks of Alabama, and he's ready to do away with a lot of the defense uh, cuts, but I don't think he speaks for the majority of them. It's a real tough, it's a tough one. And the, and I find that the people who are closest to the defense budget, the ones who really understand the dynamics of the strategy better than I do, are more concerned than the people who are just knee-jerk. Because they feel that the Pentagon is not being realistic about how to plan for a defense budget that we can actually f afford and sustain. Your thoughts on I the mean, Pentagon and the sequester? Uh, imagine you were making and spending $40,000 a year. And three months into the year, you were told, uh, by the way, your salary is immediately going to be cut by 10%, um, including what you've already spent. But you can't make any decisions about how to reallocate the money. Right. You have to spend the same exact amount of your budget on groceries, the same exact amount on rent, the same amount, exact amount on movies. Uh, that's a terrible way to budget. And that's what we're doing with the, with the Pentagon and this entire sequester. Now, will there be games to kind of help soften some of the edges of that? I'm sure. And the Pentagon and OMB, I'm sure, are working as hard as they can to find as many ways to, to sign it, ease this pain. But this is just, uh, there's no question the Defense Department is going to have to accept more cuts uh, um, over time, as is the non-defense portion of the budget. But to do this across the board without uh, any strategy, any planning, or any thought of what works and what doesn't and what's valuable and what isn't is, is um, it's just stupid. And so just, um, you know, just a pure mechanical question. I mean, setting aside politics and assuming just kind of the best case scenario politically, you know, uh, uh, these guys, for whatever reason, decide they really want to get this done in the lame duck period. I mean, is there time? Is there time to write whatever statutory language needs to be written so that um, we can avert the cliff? Are there ways of just saying, we agree to these broad principles, we'll avert the cliff, and then we'll take the next six months to sort out the details. What, what mechanically needs to happen so that we don't? Right. So I, I think that's a good question. I think we're beginning to see the possibilities here. Uh, Governor Romney is basically talking about, if I get elected, I want you to put, all, put off all this stuff so that I can come up with a budget. My gut tells me that, that Congress would love to get rid of this. And if they can say, we owe the new president a chance to come right. up with his own budget, fine. We'll push the whole thing ahead six or eight months. Uh, the much more interesting case is what happens if Obama's reelected. Uh, I think there are three possibilities. One is chaos, we go over the cliff. The second is uh, chaos, and they take the bullets out of the gun at just the last moment. And the third is the one which you're talking about. And I think you're beginning to hear Democrats talk a little bit about how that would work. They'd get some kind of agreement, which would be set a target for tax increases with some principles about how the tax increases would work. Some uh, targets for cutting growth in healthcare spending with some principles how that would work. Uh, a down payment, some things, perhaps in the non-healthcare entitlements area, maybe some little tax things, closing some loopholes, so there's a down payment. And then they try and structure it so it's somewhat more believable than the super committee deal. 
uh, something uh, for, for uh, aficionados more like reconciliation. Uh, where they have specific targets, and it's not just like what they told the super committee, find us, you know, X trillion dollars in budget savings, but it's really reflects an, an agreement. And, and then they would use that as an excuse to waive the, 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 the spending cuts and tax increases. Um, I think that's ambitious, um, but possible if after the election there's a sense, okay, we're now going to try and get something done. We'll see whether that's the sense after the election. Do you agree with the sort of universe of uh, choices there? Yeah, I, I think I don't have Pretty very much, much covered to, every yeah. possible. I don't have very much to add. I would say um, I would make two points. There is a lot of legislation that's written. There was a lot, you know. I mean, we've written a lot on some some bowls. There's a lot that was written in the super committee. There's been a lot um, people are working on privately. So it's it's not as if we're starting from scratch. Right. We've there are a ton of plans out there. There's a lot that's written in legislative language. Uh, do I think politically that we would get all of it done in the lame duck? I would say unlikely. Uh, but they could have a framework and a down payment. And the piece I would add is an enforcement mechanism. Uh, the super committee didn't work for at least two reasons. One, it was totally nonspecific. But two, the enforcement mechanism took place 400 days in the future. I mean, when has Congress ever a acted for something that was 400 days away? The debt ceiling we solved, what, with a day left? The last CR with an hour left? 400 days isn't a threat. Um, and I think that the sequester, if they kick it once, may not be a threat. So they may need to think of some specific enforcement mechanisms. For example, on the tax side, they may want to agree to, you know, X hundred billion dollars or trillion dollars on the tax side with an across the board cut to tax expenditures, to so deductions and credits to pay for it. And the spending s within Medicare, perhaps they want to have the trigger specifically hit providers and beneficiaries, et cetera. So I think you combine that framework, fit, process, down payment with an enforcement mechanism and you bring yourself some credibility uh, with the markets. And hopefully, um, it's in the spirit of an agreement where politicians are using this enforcement just to make them do what they already want to do, uh, not to do something they don't. And one other thing, it has to be understood that um, a lot of Republicans, a lot of Democrats are going to vote against it. It's not going to be one that you can do with, uh, with only Republican votes or only Democratic votes. And you're not gonna, you might not even get a majority of the Republicans to vote for it. Um, so. It requires something of a sea change in the political climate, and that counting on that seems a little bit like counting on Peter Orzag's health care savings. Well, I, I also think, presuming the status quo, the president wins, the Republicans keep the House, uh, you can't do it without John Boehner, you can't do it without Dave Camp, and you can't do it without Max Baucus. I think those are, and you can't do it without the president. Those are kind of the four players you need in the final deal. Um, so just briefly, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions, but let's, let's just talk a bit about taxes, tax reform, um, what we might see going forward. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Bull Simpson had a, had a framework. A lot of people like yourselves praised Bull Simpson. Um, uh, you know, on one level, uh, it was the kind of thing that you draw up on paper and looks great, but politically is, is just incredibly difficult. Um, is, is that still kind of... Um, is that still a model that we can, or is that a model that we can actually approximate in policy, or is that just sort of this ideal that you know will never come close to? Um, Mark, maybe I'll start with you since you actually worked on the uh, on the commission. Yeah, I, I'm maybe a little bit biased here, um, but it's it's not as if Paul Simpson was just this broad general framework. Paul Simpson had a lot of specifics, and we've actually taken those and put them into legislative language. So yes, you can translate into policy. Now the second question, is it politically achievable? Uh, I, I think it's about as politically achievable as you can get if that's the amount of deficit reduction you want. Yeah, and and, and specifically, I'm, I'm referring to sort of the, the, close, the ending of the tax uh -huh. expenditures, which is obviously, you know. Uh, the, on the tax the, side, it's going to be, it's, the tax side is going to be very tough. Uh, I think what we found was Republicans didn't want to raise taxes at all. Um, most of them had taken a pledge. You all may have heard of it. Uh, Democrats wanted a 50-50 uh, deal. So that was our starting point, was 50-50 versus zero. And uh, when we got to specifics, no one was really ready to talk about it. Uh, and I actually remember on the Fiscal Commission, we'd, at the staff level, we had come up with like four different tax plans. And one was like, uh, there's a bill called Whiting Gregg that was a much milder, broaden the base, lower the rates. And one was a version of that, and one was a cap on tax expenditures, and one, we just took things to pay for other things. And Erskine Bowles said, what would happen if you just got rid of all of them? 
And we looked at him and we said, all of what? He said, all the deductions and credits and exclusions, all the tax expenditures. And we thought he was crazy because um, you're going to want a mortgage interest deduction, you're going to want a charitable deduction, et cetera. And his response to that was, but make people add it back. Start with the premise that you have a clean tax code and then make people make decisions. And they pay for them with higher rates. So uh, do I think we can you know, get the rate down to 24 or even 28? Maybe not. But I think if we start from that zero plan type premise, there's no deductions and exclusions and credits. Because these, many of these really are major government subsidies and spending that go primarily to the wealthy. And when we actually have to justify adding them back in by, by, through higher rates, I think you'll find people are more austere than you give them credit for. Uh, I think that there's uh, some trade-offs here. If the Republicans want to lower tax rates, then they're going to have to pay for it by removing some of the tax expenditures. That's a given. Uh, there's a big difference about whether you're going to use this to raise revenue or not. The 1986 tax reform thing didn't raise any revenue. The administration wants to use tax reform to raise revenue, and the Republicans so far say they don't. So that's a big problem. The second thing, and this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but um, if you want to maintain the differential between capital gains and ordinary income rates, and you want to do away with tax expenditures, and you want to lower the tax rates, you start with having one of those uh, trilemmas that you've got to give on something. And I don't think that's compl completely sunk in. But I do think that what the, the service that Bo Bull Simpson did a couple of really important things. One is it kind of made it seem possible to deal with the deficit whereas before it didn't. Second, it put a couple of uh, good faces on the idea of deficit reduction who are pretty good at going around and selling it. But the third was, and this was one of substance, to say maybe we should be thinking about broadening the tax base to raise uh, revenues rather than just always raising rates. And they kind of put that on the table. This notion that we're spending through the tax code, they, they helped introduce that idea which is, of course, you know, all the tax economists have been talking about this for a year, but it now has much wider uh, credibility. So I think it will be part of some eventual solution. Yeah, and it's interesting. The dilemma you describe isn't exactly the dilemma that, um, that you see if you start digging into Romney's tax plan, but it's, it's similar, Close. right? I mean, yeah. he's well, that's exactly <coughs> right. Um, Governor Romney wants a plan that's revenue neutral, lowers the rates, and maintains progressivity. And the tax expenditures do go mostly to the wealthy, even things like mortgage interest, state and local. So you can raise, lower the top rate some. But if you don't look at least um, at reducing the differential between capital gains rate and the ordinary rate. Which he does not want to do. Which he does do. not want to do. Um, it's, it's very difficult to have substantial rate reduction at the top. Um, just one thing that I was, I was struck by in David's book, um, which is just this. Um, this discussion of kind of corporate taxes versus income taxes and how most economists will tell you, you know, our corporate tax system is pretty uncompetitive with the rest of the world. Uh, most business people, executives will tell you the same thing. And it struck me that one, <laughs> yeah, to understate it wildly, um, uh, but it struck me that, you know, I mean, one very easy fix, which is not on the table anywhere, but, it, you know, if, if people really want to put their money where their mouth is, we could dramatically lower corporate rates and, um, and make up the revenue by making the income tax system much more progressive, right? I mean, as income inequality has increased over time, we now have billionaires paying the same top marginal rate as millionaires, which is kind of crazy, um, we could, you know, I mean, obviously, there, there's only so you much. You feel bad for the millionaires? Is that? <laughs> yes, exactly. Who cries for the poor millionaires who are uh, paying the same rate as a billionaire? Um, uh, but no, I mean, I, I guess my, my the, the, the broader point is, you know, there are ways to make up revenue if you're, if you're serious about it. And, and it, it's a matter of priorities in the, in the same way that the Bull Simpson exercises a matter of priorities. And, you know, we, we could get ourselves a much sleeker, more efficient corporate tax system if we were serious about making up the revenue. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, there's a number of CEOs who will privately say, reduce corporate taxes and raise my individual taxes. But they don't seem to be a lot of them that want to go on record for the Wall Street Journal saying that. Right. Um, and so I think that's it. I think that the thing about the corporate, in, there's two things about the corporate income tax that have changed and that make this uh, different. One is uh, capital is much more mobile and business is much more mobile than ever before. We really have a globalized economy. It's much more difficult for the U.S. to run a different kind of tax system than the rest of the world than it was uh, 30 years ago. And the second thing is a whole lot of businesses have taken themselves out of the corporate tax thing. So you have this 
part of the corporate tax fight is this fight between the big multinationals, which pay the corporate income tax, and the growing number of firms, not all of them small, that choose not to be organized in that fashion. So they made the Rubik's Cube of this much more difficult. So there's kind of two views on this. One is, oh my god, we can't do all this stuff at once because it's all so complicated, so we should break it into pieces. And we'll do the corporate tax here, the individual tax here. And then other people say, but they're so intri int intricately linked, and it's going to be so hard to do without making this thing even worse, that the only way you can solve it is to do them all at once, which is why it's all hard. You can't write the final legislation in the lame duck, for sure. Uh, one of the interesting things about the 1986 tax reform is we raised taxes on corporations a lot. And CEOs were willing to accept that because they saw right. big reductions right. in their individual tax rate. Uh, you know, as a matter of kind of fairness and principle, it certainly makes sense to go the other way. There's no such thing really as a rich corporation. Right. There are rich people that own corporations or own parts of corporations. Yeah, right. This entire, I know Matt Romney got attacked for a lot of it partially because it was a faux pas of how he said it. Sure. But it's true, there's only rich people. There's no rich corporations. Um, so as, as a question of fairness, probably makes a lot of sense. It's a question of politics. I think any attempt to lower rates on corporate, to lower overall tax burden on corporations and pay for it on the individual side, even from very high earners, I think it's going to be very tough. Yeah, one thing I was struck by this, this uh, polling uh, statistic that you mentioned in the book, I think it was a Pew poll that showed that Americans basically think that they're paying about the right amount of taxes. They don't feel overtaxed, right? Um, uh, but they, the, the question of fairness looms very large. Um, and that, that struck me as a very telling data point uh, you know, that, that tells you a lot about our, our, our political moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, well, let me, there's obviously a lot more to get into, but I think the most efficient way to do it is probably to open up the floor to questions. So why don't we do, why don't we do that? And there's a mic. There's a mic coming way. here. Yeah. It's right in the front. Over the corner. Good afternoon. I'm Todd Wiggins. I'm happy to be here. And I have a quick question about the, the strategy uh, for the Obama campaign going into the, the final few months. Uh, there was a meeting of his top fundraising strategists at the W Hotel just three days ago this week. And uh, they handed out a, uh, a game plan for attacking the uh, Romney um, rhetoric that we've heard from the last uh, couple, uh, week or so. And one of the things that they said was that uh, that Mr. Romney was was uh, a failure in his um, strategies in New Hampshire, or, or I'm sorry, when, in, when he was governor, when it came to um, job creation, tax strategies, uh, all those things that that are important uh, to, for, uh, right now in this election. So how do we? What's the countermeasure to that? I know as a, as an author, you have to you're trying to be uh, sort of bipartisan, but do you have a a, um, do, do you have a prediction as to how this is going to turn well, out in the end? Um, I th uh, my prediction is it's going to be a close election. Um, <laughs> uh, look, what frustrates me is, and, and I know Mark and his crowd are pushing this, is in all this back and forth, it's very hard for people to get a sense of what would these two men do and what would they do differently for the budget. And so the notion that wouldn't it be amazing if we had one of the debates where before the debate, they agreed on, on the baseline for the deficit, and they agreed on a target for reducing it. And instead of talking about who did what to whom in 1999, and did you or did you not uh, say this in some uh, out of context clip of which both sides are now uh, participating, they had to say, this is how I would solve the problem. Not three little things, but this is what I do on taxes. This is what I do on defense. This is what I do on Social Security. This is what I would do on health care. And this is what I do on everything else, which doesn't matter all that much. <laughs> and if we had, if we had them, to, so they had to present us a menu of their options, I think it would be incredibly healthy. First of all, it would allow people to make a choice because they'd have some sense. We wouldn't have to get into these things where we have to figure out what it is they really mean when they give us vague plans. But secondly, it would give the winner some kind of a mandate. The winner could actually say, I went to this debate. I said this is what I was going to do. I won. I don't control the Congress, but you should do what I want because the people voted for me. I'm afraid that's not going to happen, but I think that would be much more constructive than another series of these ads. I, s I swear I didn't uh, <laughs> Plant the pay, pay David to, to say that, but we actually have a petition at debatethedebt.org, which is asking 
um, the presidential commission committee to, I'm sorry, the presidential debate commission to do just that, that debate the debt.org. All right. And by David's book. <laughs> Retired Foreign Egg Service. Yeah, I have, uh, first of all, um, in addition to all the issues that you have so expertly discussed, there is a current budget limit that's supposed to be breached sometimes in October or November. Uh, what will Congress do about that? You mean the debt limit? The debt limit. Yeah. The debt limit is coming up, yeah. What? And also, how long will the Federal Reserve Board is planning to keep interest rates at zero levels? It's really hurting retirees and people that rely on fixed income. Yeah. Well, uh, the debt ceiling, will, uh, the last word from the Treasury is that we'll hit the debt ceiling at the end of this year, and then they'll do all the uh, gaming that they usually do, uh, lawful gaming. Uh, they'll get them through January or early February. Um, and I think that's another thing that will be on the minds of Congress as they decide. But it, won't look, it doesn't look to me like we'll have that showdown uh, before the end of the year, before the new Congress comes in. Uh, the Federal Reserve has said that it will keep interest rates low through 2014. Uh, I believe them. And uh, I think, if anything, it will be longer than that because that's their strategy <coughs> to try and keep the economy growing. Anytime the central bank keeps interest rates low, uh, it hurts savers and helps borrowers. And that's what's going on right now. And uh, they're aware of that, but their reading of the pluses and minuses is that it's better to keep the economy going and try and create some more jobs and avoid deflation. And the, one of the costs is uh, to the to retirees who live on fixed incomes. Um, let's go in the back. Um, gentleman in the blue shirt and tie. Uh, I'm Basil Scarless. I've lived and worked in Europe most of my life. And one thing surprises me here in our debate is we on on budgets and deficits. We rarely talk about public investment, especially the way Europeans do. They have an, a separate investment budget, and all spending is equally evil in this country. And I'd like to know, do you foresee any chance that perhaps Obama would stand up in one of those debates and say, I'll reduce the deficit over me, me, the medium term, but I'm going to focus on growth since we can grow our way out of this problem to some extent, and I'm going to focus on a major public investment program for this country, which is the best way to get growth started because of multiplier effects and whatnot? Uh, well, first of all, if it's seen as being anything copying the Europeans, it's dead. So I recommend if you're in favor of that, you remove the, the, the prologue. Uh, secondly, the president talks quite a bit about public investment. Uh, I think he's with the program. Um, I think he's having a hard time selling it. But I think there is a sense. In fact, when the president is at his most articulate, and I think I've heard this more in the, in the small off-the-record things with reporters, more than I've heard it in public. He says, why should we fix the deficit? Because if we don't fix the deficit, I'm never going to be able to do all the things in public, uh, in public investment, infrastructure, and education that I think are essential to grow. So I, think there's a, I, don't, I don't think that's off the table at all. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if we do this grand bargain in the lame duck that it allows for some infrastructure spending, which may be described as investment in the future. It may be described as helping jobs now. Uh, it will not be described under any circumstances as stimulus. Or as European. Or as European, <laughs> correct. Right. European stimulus would it really <laughs> now to right, anything. Right. 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 And you know, I wouldn't, sir, I'm not so sure I would go too far on, we got a lot of problems here. And we could do better with more growth, although growth is not going to solve our deficit thing. But the, um, the case that the Europeans have a great growth strategy right now is a little uh, fragile, I'd say. Yeah. No, that, I, I, I would just second what David said. I mean, you know, Obama's uh, theme for his State of the Union address in 2011 was win the future. And that was, that was their pivy, or you could argue not, not so great, <laughs> distillation of, of precisely that strategy, that we, we we, uh, we feel like there is an appetite for spending, but it's got to be investments and investments with returns. And, and we have to pair and prune so that these things will be politically possible. Just in terms of the broader picture, and this uh, is borne out a little bit in David's book, part of the problem with the current budget is uh, the pieces that go to consumption, particularly Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, are growing. And the pieces that go to investment are, are shrinking, both as a share of the economy uh, and in real terms, I think. Uh, I think there'd be agreement, broad agreement among economists that that should be reversed. Um, 
Let's go in the very, very back. Yeah, all the way in the back in the dark shirt. So my, my name is Eddie Edges, and I, I'm actually, uh, I represent federal employees. And uh, I can tell you that as to sequestration, I think the thing that was most shocked me was that there were, in fact, no plans, that we tried to get the agencies to talk about it, and they said, basically, it would not happen. Uh, I think this, the, when, when we talked, when the Republicans tried to uh, uh, exempt defense, what that would have meant for the... Uh, for the agencies that, like HUD and education, et cetera, would have been 20, 25 percent uh, cuts, incredible cuts. And I, I, I mean, I think the reason for the deal itself was to prevent any kind, you know, one, the cut from defense, but actually move it on and try to get some kind of deal. And I think that's what, that's what they're planning to do. I don't think we'll ever see sequestration. Right. I think that uh, you're, the point you're making is the right one, which is they set up something that was awful and unworkable, so we wouldn't get there. And then when you say to, to people, okay, well, how will this actually work? Well, they don't want to say that because they want it to be awful and unworkable, uh, so we don't get there. And so it's just where we are. It's the problem with trying to do this by rules that force you to come to a consensus instead of coming to a consensus and then using the rules to enforce what you've agreed to. Right. Though I, I agree with the other point that you make that, I mean, had defense been exempted, right, suddenly it becomes perfectly workable right. for one side. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> And then you're going to get no agreement. Right. So this may not be the idea way, but, uh, you know, the, the right. counterfactual is not very good. Um, yes, in the, the goatee. Uh, my name is Christopher Watson. I work at the National Science Foundation. Um, if uh, the unemployment rate were to stay at about 8% over the next six months to year, what effect would that have on the discussion over the deficit, do you think, the political discussion? Uh, probably all of us are this. Uh, so I, th I think a weak economy kind of pushes in two directions. On the one hand, you don't want to actually do substantial deficit reduction if you can avoid it when the economy is weak. So you'd want um, uh, that doesn't mean you can't enact deficit reduction. In fact, you should, but it should take place in the future. So I think a weaker economy in that sense will make it harder. On the other hand, a weaker economy uh, kind of maintains this public anger that Washington is broken, and the deficit is a big symbol of that. So I think uh, you would see many people seeing this as a symbol that uh, we don't have our economy under control because we don't have our deficit under control. Therefore, there should be deficit reduction. So I don't know if that's a push or... Uh, or, right. or who I, wins. I agree with that. And there's one other factor. If you wanted to do anything uh, that looked like fiscal stimulus, it would be very hard to do unless it was done in the context of a longer-term deficit reduction package. But I hope we're not dealing with that problem, an 8.3% unemployment rate a year from now, because that would be devastating. Um, yes. Yeah. My name is Stephanie Rubenstein. I'm a student at the University of Michigan. Um, at the end of the first chapter of your book, you talk about how it's currently an unsustainable situation. And I noticed that as a recurring theme throughout the book. Do you think that the fiscal cliff and what's to come is going to instill a sense of in Washington that we need to be more responsible and to live more sustainably? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, it, it, when I worked on the book, I, I was really, you know, I had moments where I think, my God, this country's gone off the deep end, and then I had moments where I thought, maybe it won't be so bad. And I, um, I, I talked a lot to Leon Panetta, who's now the defense secretary, but has been around this for a long time. And um, I quote him at the end of the book uh, as saying, I used to tell the students that we are either governed by leadership or crisis. And I always thought that if leadership wasn't there, then ultimately you rely on crisis to drive decisions. In the last few years, my biggest concern is that crisis doesn't seem to drive decisions either. So there goes my theory. I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, anyone who's been around the budget for long enough is a pessimist by nature. Uh, the one good news now is the outcome of not doing deficit reduction is so horrible that that uh, politicians might see it as the better alternative. Uh, now, maybe they'll just punch on the fiscal cliff. Uh, 
But I, I think that there will be popular uh, opposition to that, both, both elite and grassroots. I think that we're seeing a large number of people increasing their anger at Washington. If they just see Washington punt again, do nothing for this problem that they're being told is the number one most important problem, uh, I'm not sure they're going to stand for it. So uh, for all of those cynical reasons, I'm hopeful. Maybe that's a good place to end. OK, thank you. Great questions. Right. Noam, has a, so Noam has been very uh, reluctant to promote his own book, which is a really good description of what the hell was going on inside the Obama administration. Thank you all for good questions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>